Oh, it started to record for all of us. Thank you. So I'm so excited to introduce our keynote speaker, um, Lessa Kanani Opua Palayo Lazada. She is the 2022, <coughs> excuse me, the 2022-2023 President of the American Library Association and Adult Services Assistant Manager at the Palos Verdes Library District in Southern California. She is a past executive director and past president of the Asian Pacific American Librarians Association. In 2022, she received the American Library Association Elizabeth Butas Catalyst for Change Award and was named a library journal mover and shaker in the advocacy category. Much of her work focuses on promoting and achieving equity, diversity, and inclusion in libraries and librarianship. She lives in San Pedro, California with her poet husband, Christian Hans Lozada, and their menagerie of pets. Find out more about her at lessaforlibraries.com. And I'm just so thrilled to introduce her. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Oh, why can I stop sharing it? Okay, there. And um, I will turn it over to Lessa. I'm so happy you're here. And also I'll be monitoring the Q&A. So we have a facilitated Q&A at the end. I'm turning off my camera now. Up. Mahalo for the introduction, Jenny, and aloha kakahiaka. Oh, geez, Louise, I can't even speak this morning. Aloha kakahiaka, Hawaii Library Association from Leeward Community College, where I am tuning in today. And it would be an understatement to say that speaking to all of you as the first Kanaka Pelikakena of the American Library Association is one of the most humbling experiences of my life, as I recognize the weight of the role, my place in this space and my responsibility to all of us. Last week, when I was at the Sharjah International Book Fair and Library Conference in the United Arab Emirates, I wondered what they could possibly be interested in in my experience as a library worker and library leader. I wondered what experiences would resonate the most with folks from the Middle East and Africa, 250 individuals from over 12 countries with panels and keynotes being translated back and forth between Arabic and English. What I discovered after visiting their beautiful libraries with state-of-the-art technology and meditation gardens and top-line maker spaces was there is much that we share culturally. We share through the desire to access information, value wisdom and knowledge and embrace changing communities. I heard stories of connecting with their communities by doing things like embracing the oral traditions of elders bringing in the desert sand to show the connection between the outside and the inside of the library, and creating a safe and secure space for everyone who walks through the doors. All things that resonate with me as a Kanaka librarian, although perhaps instead of desert sand, ocean water. All of these things I saw also in my travels throughout the US and heard about at conferences like the Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries and Museums, ATOM, where I also saw the fierce Haoli Hiva Hiva Moniz share and demonstrate how tapping into our Hawaiian culture can not only teach students and their families the traditions that we've lost, but bring them back and make their space feel like home. Building home and building community through information and learning brings me joy, and I'm sure brings all, you, all of you joy in your work. But it is not always easy for us as library workers and library lovers in an increasingly divided and chaotic world to do so. We must be brave as we build. We have all been brave over the last few years, but we have been asked to do the impossible, both in libraries and our personal lives. We, whether formally or not, during virtual programs and reference calls, during curbside service or with patrons in our libraries, we have been asked to be first responders, trauma counselors, social workers, and shelters, as well as places for information, discovery, and rejuvenation. And we have done all that we have been asked to do, and we have grown and reinvented what it means to be a library in every aspect of our work. We have followed in the role of the resistors and brave ones who came before us, both as library workers and as members of our communities. We have had to be brave for ourselves, for each other, and for the communities we are members of. Our brave communities have made it this far, fractured and some divided, but we've made it. And it's now time for us to restore, connect, and reflect on the voyage that we're on as we imagine our vision of the future, to move forward as together as we can be when it feels like some 
Sometimes we are under attack, we are burnt out, and we are fighting for our core values. In our time together today, I'll share a bit about what roots my leadership style. I'll also share some updates on censorship challenges across the United States, and I'll challenge us to do better, to grow, and to truly become the inclusive spaces we strive to be if we embrace being brave and embrace our communities. During times like this, times of change and growth and healing, when I'm not always certain what the future holds, I turn to the values I'm rooted in from my upbringing. So I start today with Al and Mary Palayo. They instilled in me, my siblings, and my cousins the values of Kukua, service, and Kuleana, responsibility. And may I just say it's very nice to probably not have to explain what these words really mean to an audience, because you're all entrenched in them as well. But of course, we believe in Kukua to others and our community, regardless of who they are or their background. All are part of our family, our ohana, and deserve our help. My grandparents demonstrated a life of service to us by growing the Hawaiian community in Los Angeles, away from our homeland, by creating civic clubs, festivals, and supporting hula schools, perpetuating a cultural life for Hawaiians in California. They helped to expand our community and ensure future generations were connected to our culture and to the Aina, even if we were unable to live here on the land of our ancestors, because that is our Liana. These are the values that I rely upon as a leader and a library worker to push me forward. We are all a part of many different communities, including the community of library workers and leaders, which we are all a part of. And using Kukua and Kuleana, our library community works together to uplift diverse voices and work against censorship. Our community encourages our patrons' right to read. Our community resists those who wish to silence us and we uplift each other with our voices. We must be brave and be heard and speak up and speak out for ourselves and our communities. And the best way we can do this work is to speak with a collective voice, to come with a collective message and to work together towards not only the freedom to read, but the freedom to liberate. But how do we activate our community in that way when it feels like we are often so alone, sometimes especially right now, as we are coming back together in person more and more? When activating, I turn to Bell Hooks's idea that not only do communities sustain life, but that, quote, one of the most vital ways we sustain ourselves is by building communities of resistance, places where we know we are not alone, end quote. This idea shows me that activation is possible when we work together. Because not feeling alone has been difficult when we've been isolated from one another. Reconnecting with our communities can be difficult when we are sometimes hanging on by a bare thread ourselves. For me, when I was underemployed for years after library school during the last recession, struggling to find full-time work, and even now when I sometimes struggle to find my professional community, I turn to the American Library Association, and I am inspired by all of the leaders standing up for our shared values and resisting on our behalf. I am inspired by those who know that our role as library workers is to help liberate individuals to learn and grow and see themselves in the library and to build communities to ensure a strong future. We know that LGBTQ youth who feel seen are less likely to inflict self-harm. We know that children who can picture themselves in Wakanda or on Mars or as a doctor or a love interest because they see those who look like them portrayed will grow up to be confident whole members of society. And we know that people being whole members of society can be threatening to those who use systemic oppression to remain in power. And this is scary to those who see that system, a system that was built deliberately cracking and changing. And this is scary to those who know, like we do, that libraries are the key to community building and restoring our communities to our whole selves. And I say this also as president-elect of an institution, or as president of an institution that has its own sordid history that we are reckoning with. And as a member of a profession that didn't always believe that every single person, regardless of race or ethnicity or class, had a right to participate. 
I recognize the bravery, fight, and resistance of those who came before me to make it even possible for a continent-born, mixed-race, Native Hawaiian woman to be the first Pacific Islander president of the Asian Pacific American Librarians Association and the American Library Association. Folks who modeled resistance and community building in ALA and out, like our founders of the National Associations of Librarians of Color, who allowed me to see I and everyone might have a place in ALA and especially in our libraries. Those who built and continue to build up institutions in direct response to injustices within the system, in turn, pushed the system to change. The late John Lewis said, you must be bold, brave, and courageous and find a way to get in the way. And that is exactly what we need to do to make the change on the national level and the local level, right here in our own libraries. Because changes happen all around us. Nothing is forever, not even the Dewey Decimal System or the Library of Congress. We celebrated the change from the Library of Congress a few months ago to change an outdated subject heading from illegal aliens to illegal non-citizens. While recognizing it's a good start, but there's more work to go to shift to a term like undocumented immigrants. We also build on the work of folks like Dorothy B. Porter, who changed and challenged the racist Dewey Decimal System to properly classify works by black scholars, not in 326 for slavery or 325 for colonization, but in the subject areas they belonged. I modeled this example of resistance in my own library and reclassified numerous works by and about indigenous mythologies and creation stories from the 398 folktale and fairy tale classification to the religion section where they belonged, along with Greek mythology and Norse mythology. We have the power to recognize what needs to be changed on the local levels as well as the national levels and change them. But first, we need to recognize what needs to be changed and make a plan and do the dang thing that makes us the anti-racist institutions we must become. In my little over 10 years as an active ALA member, I have seen the shift in focus and the continued push towards diversity and inclusion. The desire to make our organization anti-racist, but the frustration with figuring out how to get there when we're all operating with different definitions and understandings of not only equity, diversity, and inclusion, little side note, the Office for Diversity, Literacy, and Outreach Services has a great shared definition we can use, but not only because we have different understandings of the foundation of this work, but because we have different understandings of how this work must be done in order to be successful. ALA has had over 20 years of spectrum scholars and the profession's diversity needle has barely moved. Much anecdotal evidence points to difficult environments for people of color, working in systems where often we are the only one, where we have to explain ourselves over and over again, where we are not trusted and uplifted and have to struggle to be heard. Programs like Spectrum show the value of what a community can do for BIPOC and for all of us, even if we do feel alone, and show us how we can use bravery to get in the way and make good trouble. Groups like Na Hawaii Imiloa make the space also to be Kanaka and understand what that means in a colonized world and a colonized profession and gave me a sense of home. I wanna emphasize also that though, in the, that though that inclusion and diversity are not limited to race and ethnicity, although we start there because race is the greatest predictor of one's life outcome. I wanna recognize our institutions are also not built for our disability communities, our neurodivergent communities and colleagues, and the need for universal design to be incorporated into our work is essential right now. So what can we do as a community right now for this, for all of this? How can we support the resistance necessary to make real change as we continue living with COVID? We are poised perfectly for that real change coming out of two and a half years that actually made many programs more accessible for folks by going virtual and incorporating those principles as best we can and advocating for the budgets necessary to make that happen going forward in the hybrid model. We can start by actually listening to and reading the words and demands of those being brave, of those resisting, of those resisting with love, 
trying to make us all better and connecting action with those words. Sometimes that means getting out of the way and letting someone else take the lead. Sometimes that means putting money towards donations to programs like Spectrum or our National Associations of Librarians of Color or memberships to organizations like ALA or ATOM or going find free. Sometimes that means feeling the weight of responsibility and being of service to your community. It is intentional that the folks whose names and mana I invoke today are all people of color, most of them women. I use these examples and I elevate these stories and quotes and ideas to emphasize what happens when we are brave and listen to our resistors and see the change that happens in our communities and our profession when we are of service to and are responsible for each other. Blurry photo, sorry. For ALA is a place for us to be of service to one another and our values, to work together to make the world that we wanna see to try out new ideas and make change. It is often slow and it is often difficult in bureaucratic institutions. And the work should not be entirely altruistic. We get things back from our investment in ALA. Sure, there are webinars and discounts and conferences, but there are skills and leadership development that will take us even farther. I learned the best project management skills through ALA, coordinating volunteers across the country with varying levels of capacities to work towards a common goal. While we definitely get that in libraries, we get it on steroids in ALA. My supervisory skills continue to be honed by pseudo supervising volunteers who don't have payment hanging over their head as the motivator. I've learned how to motivate groups and I've had groups and networks that I could rely upon to help bring clarity to my day-to-day -day work. Was my library unique in its challenges? Were my managers unique in their shortcomings or strengths? I learned that rarely was my library unique and often our challenges are shared and by sharing with others outside of my library, outside of California and the US as ALA also has a fair amount of international members, I learned new perspectives on how to move the work forward and how to be brave for my community. And it is not always being of service to ALA, being of service to our communities and being of service to ourselves. As a Leslie Nope aspirer, I had to learn that shirking sleep and all other responsibilities for the library good is not realistic. The number of times I've had to say no to preserve my own sanity until I could come back to the work, while it probably should be a higher number, should also be celebrated. And you should celebrate the times that you balance yeses, nos, and your capacity. To do the work of real change, we have to make sure we are doing it with intention and meaning and within the capacity that we have. Burnout is real, and the real work that we need to do together on top of the work that we do on a daily basis on behalf of our institutions and our families and our friends is not small or light work. We have to constantly restore ourselves to be there for others. But when we do that work, the load gets, when we do that work together, the load gets lighter. We build community along the way and we learn and grow and shape our own futures together. Hawaiian scholar, an activist, Honani K. Trask said in her defining book from a native daughter, life-changing book for me, resistance must be its own reward. We often will not see the fruits of our labor, especially when we are talking about justice in our lifetime. We must trust that our resistance will set the stage and make the path for those who follow us easier so that their resistance builds to create communities of love and strength that we were never able to imagine or envision together. So I ask you all today, how will you resist? More importantly, how will you build community? How will you root yourself in love to do this work, in service or responsibility? And I also want to be clear, I'm not asking us to further engage in vocational awe, as Fabazi Attar talks about. Vocational awe, the navel-gazing belief that libraries are inherently good the belief that often keeps us from doing the hard work of changing our libraries and our cultures because it questions our supposed inherent worth. I am talking about the responsibility we have, one which Atar also asks of us, to push vocational awe aside and look at libraries in the raw, to critique and improve, to deconstruct, to bring in new ways of knowing and classifying and amplifying the work of folks 
like Dr. Sandy Littletree, who teaches about the intersections of indigenous systems of knowledge and the library. I ask us all here today to identify one or two things that are barriers to being the anti-racist institutions we need to be in order to show up for ourselves as library workers and show up for our communities. It can seem like something as simple, which is really difficult to accomplish, but something as simple as signage, like having dual language signage in both Alelo Hawaii and English, like at Nanakula Library, or incorporating traditional cultural practices into outreach by providing an intergenerational story and activity hour that promotes Hopi language learning through the Hopi Public Library bookmobile. Start small and dream big. And if you're not already involved, one plug for ALA, I'm kind of obligated to do it, but I hope you'll all join me in ALA as we identify what needs to be done and do this work. Passionate people make up ALA, as seen in this photo of Spectrum Scholars with past ALA president and Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. There are many ways to do passionate good work. While serving on committees is one way, it is not the only way to make ALA better. ALA is a member-driven organization, just like HLA is. Each of us is ALA. When we speak out on blogs or Twitter or to school and library boards, we are speaking as ALA. When we say ALA needs to do this, that's us. It's not a giant institution. It's a bureaucratic one. It feels unwieldy. But when you break it down, it's an amazing staff of over 200, but a membership of tens of thousands that can make a wave and make a difference. And speak out to create a wave we must. Our trusted library spaces are becoming political battlegrounds for those who proclaim to be in favor of free speech and the First Amendment, as long as it aligns with their values and ideals and will support their political outcomes. In 2021, ALA's Office for Intellectual Freedom tracked the highest numbers of challenged and banned books in its 20-year history. 729 challenges to library, school, and university materials and services resulted in more than 1,597 individual book challenges or removals. By comparison, in 2019, because 2020 is a mythology of a year that I hear happened, but who really knows anymore, in 2019, ALA tracked 377 challenges in which 566 books were targeted. That's half, half the number that would come in 2021, a number that doubled in less than two years. And this year, not even the whole year, but from January 2022 to August 2022, in eight months, only eight months, 681 challenges have been reported, resulting in 1,651 individual challenges. In the eight months of this year alone, we have surpassed the number of individual challenges because the reports coming in are grouping lists of books together, whereas previously they were individual titles coming forward for complaint. And these lists are organized efforts, organized attacks against the freedom to read and the freedom of speech by a minority of individuals. And what are they banning? We know what they are. Books by and about LGBTQIA+, and Black and Indigenous people of color authors, characters, and histories. Under the guise of being sexually explicit, pornographic, anti-police, and promoting specific social agendas, we know that the target is inclusion and identities and stories that have been historically silenced to keep those in power in power. The intersection of social justice and intellectual freedom to many is a difficult one to grasp, but to me, they need each other. We need intellectual freedom to bring stories that get us to justice, that get us to light. As a child, I didn't have access to my own history as a native Hawaiian in history books. I didn't understand the overthrow and occupation of Hawaii at the hands of American capitalists for their own benefit. All I knew was that my grandparents left and it was and still is not easy to return because of soaring costs, danger to Kanaka and the Aina, an over-reliance on the tourism economy and a feeling of not always being welcome in your own home. If I'd had access to and an understanding of the fraught history of my people, just as books like the 1619 Project are bringing forward, we might have 
been able to figure out how to build a better path forward together sooner and how to integrate equity into diversity and inclusion more intentionally, rather than assuming equality was the next step and goal. The essentialness of equity, diversity, inclusion, and social justice and intellectual freedom are inherent. And when we pair them with principles like radical empathy, trauma-informed response, and cultural humility, we can see when arguments of neutrality are helpful and when they are not. And when we need to utilize other tools to ensure all who come through our doors feel seen, heard, and like they belong, regardless of those who want to silence them on the outside. <clears throat> Silencing is one of the real reasons that books are being challenged. Those seeking to silence diverse ideas and ultimately silence people. To silence, these challengers need to abolish free and equitable access to information and erode the country's commitment to freedom of expression freedom of speech, and freedom to read. When we allow a minority to trample on these freedoms, we encourage our youth to repeat the societal mistakes and perpetuate the divides ignited by cultural ignorance and lack of understanding of the lives of others. And a minority of people it is that support book bans. In a bipartisan poll conducted in early 2022, ALA found that 71% of voters across party lines oppose efforts to remove books from public libraries. Most voters and parents hold librarians in high regard. Why would you not? We're amazing. Have confidence in their local libraries to make good decisions about what books to include in their collections and agree that libraries in their communities do a good job offering books that represent a variety of viewpoints. With these statistics in mind, I invite all of you to unite with us against book bans and make your voice heard in the public arena that we need to stop these efforts and band together and stop them from coming. We need to ask our policy makers to reject any efforts to book bans and allow individuals and parents to make decisions about what they and their families read. So I ask you all to visit uniteagainstbookbans.org to learn more and join our efforts and take this message beyond the library world to our friends, families, and allies in all arenas to use the tools we have to help communities uphold our rights and privileges. At ALA, we are supporting our library workers in the Office for Intellectual Freedom with one-on-one -on -one guidance from staff expertise and support to talk through problems, provide guidance on policy creation, share talking points, attend meetings, and identify local support and local attorneys to assist. This work is all confidential and behind the scenes to protect those facing these challenges and ensure as much as we can that they don't face continued repercussions. If library workers are facing discrimination in the workplace or have lost their job while defending intellectual freedom, we also support the Merit Fund, which provides financial assistance for library workers in the midst of discrimination of challenge crises. In the last two months, the Merit Fund has supported four individuals when the yearly average used to be two. We also provide policy guidance, ALA Selection and Reconsideration Policy Toolkit for public, school, and academic libraries provides library staff, administrators, and trustees suggestions and information on why we choose the titles we add to library, school media centers, and classroom co collections. Policy is essential for combating the problem before it even hits your library. In this fight, what we are really talking about is long-term advocacy. And it takes many shapes, and I encourage all of us to be not only our own advocates, but advocates for each other. In every talk I give, I always like to end with Hawaii's Queen Kapiolani's Olelo no Eau, Kulia i Kanu'u, which means strive for the summit. It is a saying that encourages, encourages us all to continue striving towards better, towards good, towards excellence. It is up to us to strive and do the work. It is up to us to ensure that the path that was set by the resistors who came before us continues forward and is built upon. And as we strive, I encourage us to be brave, work in community, and take care of one another in the name of justice. Stand up for our values of equity, access, intellectual freedom, and social responsibility, and don't cower from critique, but embrace it and embrace resistance. For resistance is the reward. And when we build communities of resistance, we sustain ourselves and know we are not alone. But most of all, I want us to remember to be brave, 
for our brave communities. The future of libraries, if we are to be truly community focused and community spaces like we are trending towards is rooted in resistance and love, but also bravery and listening. Encouraging our community members to be partners with us in building our programs and services and defending our freedom to read is essential. So be brave, be vulnerable and purposeful. Know that your voice matters. Know that working in a library is an act of bravery every day. Each one of you is a leader. Every day you are working for true equity, diversity, and inclusion. And every day you are making the intentional choice to make ideas of all kinds available to anyone who wants to learn about them. So share your idea to improve the library. Offer to coordinate a project, no matter how big or small. Speak your truth. Show up for your colleagues and be supportive of them. And give yourself credit. Give yourself rest and give yourself the gift of knowing you've done the best that you can and will continue to, the to do the best you can in the face of adversity because you've already done a lot. So today, I wanna thank you all, thank you all and challenge you all to think of one brave thing you've done for your community and one brave thing you've done for yourself. And again, please remember to kukua, to embrace your kuleana, to build communities of resistance, to be bold, brave, and courageous and find a way to get in the way, to know resistance is its own reward, to unite against book bans, and to kulia i kanu. Mahalo for allowing me to be here today. I am grateful to be here with you virtually, and some of you hope I, I and some of you I hope in person tomorrow at the centennial celebration. I want to hear your stories, I want to see your libraries. And I want to celebrate the impacts that you've made on our communities, both this weekend and beyond. Mahalo. Thank you so much. I'm so inspired. I'm sure everyone, I see all the claps in the hearts and that's literally how my heart is right now. It's overflowing. So I just wanted to take a moment now. We do have some time for some Q&A. If, so, if anyone has some comments that they'd like to enter into the Q&A, I think that's where it is. I just, I just loved your words so much, Lessa. They mean so much to me. And I think because we're, we are uniquely positive now, we're really trying. And I love about how brave and listening, because I think that when we come from that authentic learning mindset of cultural humility, where we can listen to one another and we can be brave, because sometimes these conversations can be difficult. You're right. Like a lot of times people think, oh, libraries, they're wonderful. Okay, I might have thought that myself. <laughs> But I also know we are institutions and sometimes we've we've inherited some pretty complex institutional behavior that is our responsibility to deconstruct to help bring this love and kuleana and service to our community. Is any I'm looking, I'm checking the QA. Oh, and so I, this is our chance. We get to talk to Lessa. <laughs> I also welcome hearing your stories. Do you know if you want to share one or two instances that you've been brave to inspire others? I think that the sharing of our stories is one of the most important things that we can do because when we know that others can do it, we can see ourselves doing it too. So I really welcome hearing those stories. Drop one or two into the, the Q&A there. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be shy. But we will have opportunities to talk story with Lessa to you tomorrow. But I'm thinking, you know, people might be quiet in the Q&A right now, Lessa, but I know with for 100% certainty that there are so many acts of bravery. That's, I'm getting all cheered up a little bit. And because it's such a privilege to be part of this community where I know some conversations are happening, accomplishments are happening. People are really are doing their best to do, to be inclusive and really break down barriers. Oh. <laughs> We're just gonna keep it open a little bit if people are, okay, keep looking. Where's my chat? Okay, there it is. <laughs> I know folks are also getting ready for their 10 o'clock presentation. So there's that too. There's that a lot is of true. <laughs> and getting ready. Everybody knows where to go and just get to see. And we are so thrilled that this is part of two other discussions and panels today. Um, to one today and one tomorrow. Oh, oh, we have a couple of questions. A right to read legislation. What is your sense of the status? Yeah, so the right to read legislation that's coming out right now in many states um has 
been it's been challenging and it's been difficult because depending on the state the legislation has been passing so the office for intellectual freedom and ala's chapter relations office have been working really closely with librarians in those areas to try to combat it before it even hits that legislative issue and figuring out how to work with it afterward you know there's a story of um, a librarian in oklahoma who was put on probation because she experienced this right to read legislation and so there were many books that she couldn't teach anymore. And so on the first day of school, she brown butcher papered all of her bookshelves and told the students, they don't want you to read these books, but here's a QR code to the Brooklyn Public Library who will let you read all of these books for free. So she was put on probation. Um, she had eventually quit because she couldn't work in that environment. And so the right to read legislation is it's really a pawn for breaking down all of our educational institutions, not just libraries, but also schools and the classroom, so that we have a society that is not able to participate in critical thinking. So it's really essential for us that when we see and hear about these things that we are speaking out against it and we're holding our legislators accountable for the work that they're doing and for having them commit to the freedom to read before maybe it even gets into their brain. You know, these groups like Moms for Liberty um, that send lists of books to, to libraries, folks are not even reading them before they're challenging them because of legislation of this type. And it makes it really difficult for library workers across the country to do their jobs if they're facing fines and fear of their livelihood. So. It's awful. ALA is against it. <clears throat> I'm against it. I know we all are. And I just, I thank you folks. I know, I, I think I heard it's not quite as bad here in Hawaii yet as it is, you know, in some places of the country. Um, so hopefully it'll stay that way. And it's really important for us to stay plugged in with the organizations that you shared too, just so we're aware of that consciousness and we can provide support to our fellow colleagues and friends across the nation. Thank you for that, that, that question. I appreciate it. Um, there was another comment. This was such an inspiring speech, Lessa. I'm so looking forward to next year under your leadership, as we all are. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, while we're hit 9.45, I know we, we kind of built in a 15-minute pause between so people could get ready, but I'm just so, on behalf of HLA, we're so grateful that you were able to come be here with us and um, celebrating with us and providing your keynote speech. Oh! Which professional leaders are the best advocates against these book banning efforts? Ooh, there's some more stuff coming in. I don't know. If you folks, you have to go. It's totally fine. But let's hit these if we can. <laughs> and then there's another comment. I'm watching The Handmaid's Tale and listening to the audiobook for the first time. Oh, free books at HSPLs. Yes, I love that. And when I hear about book bans and colleagues and things like the January 6th insurrection, I get this odd sinking feeling about the connection to The Handmaid's Tale. And it is totally connected, related to that, with some of the Iran protests. Um, the author, Margaret Atwood, was talking about how she based that whole narrative on what was happening on Iran and the depletion of rights there. But go ahead, Lisa, sorry. So yeah, no, I just, I agree with the Handmaid's Tale comment. I mean, it's, I, I joke sometimes, but I'll just tell my husband under his eye, right? Because it feels like we're living in that state as our rights are being stripped of us in so many different ways. Um, and looking towards, you know, books like Handmaid's Tale, also Parable of the Sour by Octavia Butler, right? It feels like we're living in those times and using those as guides, I think, to get us out of that um, is important. Um, congressional leaders that are the best advocates against these book banning efforts, um, Senator Reed of Rhode Island is one of our biggest advocates um, on all matters legislative. Also, um, Representative Grijalda, um, who I believe is from Arizona, and Susan Collins from Maine are just some of our biggest advocates in these arenas. Um, they're always advocating for library infrastructure as well, which we know is essential as so many of our libraries are, are falling apart, um, and also making sure that we have the infrastructure and money to make sure that library workers are paid equitably um, and for the education levels and the work that we do. Um, so those are a couple of examples and we really look towards folks to encouraging your legislators to sign on and take the pledge at the Unite Against Book Bans website. Um, there's a toolkit where you have um, templates that you can use to send to your legislators, uh, encouraging them, asking them, and there is the pledge that they can take. I know elections just ended, um, but it feels like we're always in an election cycle. So getting your folks um, to sign on to the oath at any time of the year, I think is really important. And making, if you don't have a legislator that is one of those fans, making them a fan and making them a library fan by inviting them in and showing them all of the wonderful things that we do. 
Yeah, I love it. Oh, and just P.S. Senator Hirono is a big fan of libraries. Oh, yes, thank you. Oh, my God. I cannot believe I forgot Senator Hirono. She was even an AOA annual conference speaker. Please, can, yeah. can we get this part? If <laughs> I know. No, well, you're thinking nationally. You're in your national role. And then we're, yeah, so it's so wonderful. We're just so happy. Uh, we know that there's some great um, advocates here in Hawaii and beyond. Oh, oh, thanks for all. Oh, that was so wonderful. Oh, wow. Congressman Ed Case's mom was a librarian in Hilo. Thank you so much for sharing that. And then we have some wonderful comments thanking for your service and your leadership. And we've been, we have been so inspired. This is what Andrew's saying. But by your positive forward thinking and activist leadership. Aloha. Mahalo nui lo alesa. Thank you. I appreciate all you do and the inspirational words. I think we all are. I feel puffed up like I'm so excited to keep to move forward in our conference and just share ideas with one another. Lessa, thank you so much. So with that, I think it's safe to close. Oh, hit the stop recording. Stop. And um, yes.